Skeptics tell us they base their beliefs on facts while they see us as basing our faith on something that is nothing more than fairy tales. Or as Mark Twain stated it, faith is believing in what you know ain't so. Today's show demonstrates how incorrect this view is and it equips believers to defend their faith without having to have a degree in science. Coming up next on Origins, faith is not a four-letter word. Hello, my friends, and welcome to Origins. My name's Don Chapman, and it's my privilege to be your host. During this program, we showcase interesting guests who present evidence from science along with other important facts validating the truth of creation and the accuracy of the Bible. And joining us today is international speaker and author Jay Sigurd. And he has a degree in physics and a degree uh, in engineering from John Brown University. Currently, he serves as the co-founder and principal lecturer for the Creation Education Center. Jay, we're thrilled you're here. And uh, I'm excited about the material that you're presenting to us because it helps us to see that creation is not an isolated debate, but it really goes back to a worldview. So I'm excited for us today to talk about uh, faith is not a four-letter word. Sure. Well, we know that four-letter words are bad. Right. And we know that also faith is not bad, and faith isn't four letters, it's that's five. True. So it's supposed to be a, a clever title, but that's the picture we see today is that a lot of people say, well, faith is a bad thing, and they're not into faith, they're just into science and proving all those things. So that's what we're going to be taking a look at today, this whole dilemma of facts versus faith, that the skeptics tell us that they're all into facts and proven things, Whereas Christians, now well, we just have a faith and just have to believe those things. And many Christians themselves have also kind of bought into that, thinking, well, Christianity is a faith and you just have to believe it. And it really weakens their stance when they're trying to talk about Christianity or the Bible or the gospel message. I think it takes the intellectual, intellectual integrity out of, uh, out of our faith. It does, and so we need to understand this a little bit better. Right. So we're going to be taking a look at what, uh, first of all, what some other people think about faith. Very interesting. We need to know what skeptics uh, view that. So when we mention the word faith, we know what's kind of going on in their minds. And so here's an interesting quote. It said, faith is not a virtue. Faith is gullibility, dishonesty, blindness, absence of reason. Faith should not be respected. It should be detested. <laughs> Wow. And we have Sam Harris. He's one of the leading atheists around today. This is what he told us about faith. He said, it's time that we admitted that faith is nothing more than the license religious people give to one another to keep believing when reason fails. So he's not too impressed with the idea no. of faith. <laughs> then we have Christopher Hitchens. <laughs> uh, he was also an atheist. He died not too long ago. But he told us that it's called faith because it's not knowledge. Christopher always looked mad to me. He right? was always kind of angry. <laughs> yes. And we have Richard Dawkins. You're very familiar with him. Many viewers are probably familiar with Richard as well. But this is what he told us amongst many other quotes. He said, faith is a great cop-out, the great excuse to evade the need to think and evaluate evidence. Faith is belief in in spite of, even because of, the lack of evidence. Now you'll have to forgive me if I just interject here, but I look at those three I call them atheistic evangelists. And, and you know, in order to believe in evolution, you have to believe that something comes out of nothing, that life comes out of non-life, just to begin. And uh, for them to say that there's no faith in evolution, to imply that, that they've got all the facts and all we have is faith, is nonsense. They have to have an enormous faith in nothing to be an atheist. They really do it. And we say that it takes more faith to be an atheist, more faith than we have. And Christianity is a very reasonable faith where it they is. really have not a uh, basis for their faith. But this has been going on for a while, hasn't it? It's been going on for quite a long time and will continue on. We even have Mark Twain who yeah. is quoted as saying, faith is believing what you know ain't so. Unbelievable. Kind of saying, well, we know it's not true, but we're just going to believe it anyway because that's what faith is all about, which is a misnomer about faith. It's not really how it works. But this idea of faith that the skeptics give us has even crept into the church itself. And here's an interesting uh, sign that was outside of one church that said, reason is the greatest enemy that faith has. <laughs> I'm so glad that's not my name at the bottom yes. of the sign there. Uh, that, that's just, it, it's a tragedy 
that in the church we, we are arming our enemies with that kind of a mentality. Yeah, it's a terrible message to be portraying to the public it, driving it by. Scripture says in Isaiah, it says, come now, let us reason together, right. says the Lord. God wants us to use our minds and to think through things. You might as well put up a sign that says, all Christians are stupid. You right. know, I mean, it, 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 that's kind of what it says Leave your to brain me. at the door. Yes. yes, that kind of thing. Here's another sign that if your faith is big enough, facts don't count. <laughs> and that's never true with true Christian faith, at least not Orthodox Christian no. faith, is it? Yeah, they're the saying facts can, always validate our faith. They do, and, but they're saying you can leave those pesky facts you know, somewhere yeah. else. Is, if no. your faith is strong enough, it just doesn't matter at all. Well, would you talk to us about how we can defend our faith? Sure. Very, imp very important. When we talk about defending our faith, there are really two major elements to Christianity. Number one, that God exists. Number two, that you're not him. That's uh, just, my that's bad, right. <laughs> just my bad sense of humor. No. The second one is that the Bible is the word of God. So those are the two things that we believe. God exists and the Bible is his word. Now, it boils if, down to that, doesn't it? Yes, it does. If we could prove these two things, we would be done. We wouldn't have to prove anything else. We wouldn't have to prove the creation account because we know the Bible says that God created everything, so we wouldn't need to prove that. We wouldn't need to prove the flood because the Bible tells us that. We wouldn't need to prove the deity of Christ and resurrection because the Bible tells us that. And if we've already proven that God exists and the Bible is His word, we don't need to go any further. But there's a problem with this approach. Specifically, we're not supposed to prove that God exists, and you can't prove that the Bible is the inspired word of God. Now, at this point, a lot of people get really nervous thinking, wait a minute, where are you headed with this? But this is going to make perfect sense as we continue I'm glad we're here. not at the end of the show. That's yes, we're just, just getting started here. All right. Now, here's an important analogy to get this point across. Let's say you went to a hardware store and you asked a guy for a meter of rope. So he walks over to a coil, cuts off a piece and says, here's the meter of rope. Then you ask him, how do I know that that's a meter? It's a good question. He says, I know it's a meter because I use a tape measure. You say, okay. So it's not just his opinion. He's appealing to a higher authority, the tape measure. Right. Then you might ask, okay, well, how do I know the tape measure is accurate? Good question. He says, I know the tape measure is accurate because they make it in the manufacturing plants and they do it just right there. So he's appealing to an even higher authority now, not his opinion or the tape measure, but where they're making the tape measure. Okay. You have another question. How do I know they're doing it correctly in the manufacturing plant? Okay. <laughs> Well, he says, I know they're doing it right there because they're using the standards that were established at the General Conference of Weights and Measures back in 1983. And they determined that a meter is going to be basically the, light, the distance light travels in a vacuum in one 300 millionth of a second. Is that right? That's, That's what they say. It's rounded off. So wow. the exact number is 299 yeah. such, but rounded off. They were very, very precise with this. This is actually the ultimate authority for determining how long a meter is. It is that because they said it is. It's the end of the line. You can't go any higher than this. Okay, well, that simple progression, think about this. If the Bible truly is the Word of God, then it's the ultimate authority for us as Christians. And if it's the ultimate authority for us, there's no way to prove it, meaning you can't go to a higher source. There's nothing above it to like go Like a to. mega God. Let's say yeah. you know, there's a mega God out there that we appeal to, and the mega God says, okay, the book you're looking at, yeah, that was written by the subservient God that you guys worship. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. No. So we're at the end of the line. It's the ultimate authority for us. And if it is the ultimate authority for us as Christians, then there's no way to prove it. So we don't prove that the Bible is from God. It's our starting point. It's where we start our beliefs as Christians. Now, we're still building this whole uh, facts versus faith dilemma here. So getting back to this, skeptics are all about facts and proven things. Christians, they say, we just have faith. Well, everybody has a foundation for their beliefs or their worldview. Everybody starts somewhere. It's impossible not to do that. Well, everyone has got the starting point. We call it our bias, our presupposition, our beginning assumptions. You can't avoid that. Now, the skeptic wants you to believe that their starting point is all about facts and proven things. But then you can ask the skeptic, let's say he's an atheist. What do you mean by facts? Tell me more about that. He says, okay, well, you know, I'm into science and proven things. Okay, but what is science? Science is really just the thoughts and opinions of other men and women. They're looking at stuff and they're saying, this is what we believe is true. So now his foundation isn't so much facts or science, it's really the thoughts and opinions of other men and women. Then you can ask him, how do you know that you can trust the thoughts and opinions of other men and women. Well, I, I know I can trust it because I can, I can just tell that they're right. <laughs> so now he's using his own reason to tell you why that someone else is correct. 
And I would ask him, how do you know you can trust your own reason? He says, well, I know I can trust it because it, it's worked well for me throughout my life. And now he's using his reason to tell you why he can trust his reason, which is circular reasoning. And I would say, you know what? That's okay. Because everybody's got to start somewhere. I just wanted him to see he's not so much about facts. He's really trusting his own reason, but he can't actually prove that. He's assuming he can trust his reason. And that's okay. I'm not going to argue with that because everyone's got to start somewhere. Okay, what about the Christian? What is our starting point? Well, I've already mentioned that. We believe that God exists and the Bible's his word. And the skeptic says, well, you, you can't prove that. And I say, I'm not trying to prove it. I got to start somewhere. I said, you got to start somewhere and choose something. I didn't argue with that. I get to choose something too. And I believe that God exists and the Bible is his word. And then we as Christians, we start with that and then we build our understanding of science and logic, history, philosophy, ethics, morality. We build all that upon our starting point that God exists and the Bible is his word. Now, a typical defense of Christianity deals with the complexities of DNA, evidence for resurrection, Bible manuscripts, Old and New Testament, and I've given talks on all these things for many years. But here's the key point. We don't want to use evidence as proof. Science actually never proves anything. A lot of people think that's what science does. A good scientist will tell you, no, we're not really proving things. What they do is they come up with ideas about things, they gather evidence, and if they have a lot of really strong evidence, they say, this is virtually certain. But they don't know it for sure because they might discover something next week, next month, next year that overturns what they thought was true. So they're not actually technically proving things. So we don't use evidence that way, whether it's science or philosophy. So we don't use evidence as proof. And there are seven major reasons not to do this. We're just going to look at two very quickly here. Number one, we don't use evidence as proof because the skeptic may have a different interpretation of the evidence. Because in reality, facts don't speak for themselves. Every fact that we've ever seen has to be interpreted. For example, a Christian would want to look at DNA and the incredible complexities and say, well, see, that's proof that God created it because there's no way that could be an accident. But then you have an atheist who would say, no, we're looking at that DNA. We don't have all the answers yet, but we're making some progress and we think we'll be able to find natural explanations as to how DNA got here. Even more interesting, though, is a third person, another atheist, he says, you know what? Christians are right. There is no way that that DNA happened by accident. It's way too complex. It was designed. But it wasn't your God. It was aliens. <laughs> aliens <laughs> yeah, right. designed it. So we have three <laughs> different people looking at the same facts, all interpreting it that's differently. Right. So it's not just about putting evidence out there. And we actually have the order wrong. Most people think you take evidence, you come to some conclusion, and then you develop a proper worldview. In reality, we use our starting point, our worldview, to evaluate evidence and come to conclusions. It's true. So it's just the opposite order. And it's true for all of us. Right. Another reason, which is reason number six out of seven, is that it elevates science or evidence over the authority of God's word, saying that science can tell us whether or not the Bible is true. Now, it sounds great to say science proves the Bible, but if we do that, we're saying science has a higher authority, can tell us whether or not the Bible is true. And maybe it's looking good now, but maybe next month they'll discover something that doesn't look so good. Then we'd have to say, well, okay, I guess maybe the Bible isn't the inspired word of God. And then later it is, and then it isn't, and then it is, back and forth and back and forth. The whole time allowing science to be an authority over God's word. In reality, it's just the opposite. We need to use the Bible and authority over science. The Bible provides a nice framework to help us properly understand science. It doesn't give us every detail. It wasn't intended for that, but it does provide a proper a trustworthy framework to interpret science. So we don't use evidence to prove the existence of God or the inspiration of the Bible. It is truly our starting point as Christians. Some people get depressed at that point, think, well, wait a minute, then what good is evidence? I've, I've got all these facts that I've memorized and now you're telling me I can't use them? I'm not saying that at all. There is a place for evidence. We use it when we test worldviews. We take them out for a test drive. We have those starting points, what we've chosen to start with, what we've assumed to be true to begin with. Now we're going to use evidence to test these worldviews to see how well they work. And for our brief talk here, we're going to look at a philosophical example and a scientific example. Example number one has to do with logic. So this is kind of philosophical, but it's really interesting. We're just testing worldviews here. We can look at logic with these worldviews. You can ask the atheist some questions. Do you believe that logic exists? They're probably going to look at you and say, what, are you crazy? Of course I believe logic exists. Say, okay, I'm just checking. 
do you believe there are actually laws of logic, like the law of non-contradiction? I can't both be standing here talking to you right now and not standing here talking to you right now. They say, yeah, there are laws of logic. Okay. Are these laws physical things? Can I take them into a laboratory and bend them and paint them and weigh them? And you'd say, no, they're, they're not physical things. They're, they're immaterial, okay, non-physical. All right, are they the same everywhere? Are they the same here as they are in Miami, as they are on the moon? Are they different in different places? You say, no, they're, they're the same everywhere, okay? Do they change? Will they be the same tomorrow as they are today? Were they the same a thousand years ago as they are now, or do they change? He would say, well, no, they, they don't change. They stay the same. Okay, so you're telling me you believe there are laws of logic that are immaterial, non-physical, universal, the same everywhere, and unchanging. Yep, that's what I believe. Okay, then I have one other question for you. <laughs> Where did they come from? You're an atheist. You don't believe in anything other than physical matter and energy, but you don't believe that matter and energy can create non-physical things, but yet you believe in these non-physical laws of logic. So using your worldview, the thing you chose, explain to me where they came from and explain to me what is it in your worldview that tells you that they're the same everywhere. And then again, using your worldview, your choice, explain to me how do you know they never change? What is it in your worldview that explains that? There's actually nothing whatsoever in their worldview that can, export, it can explain the existence of logic or these other attributes that they give to it. But they believe in logic, they use it, and they want you to be logical, but they can't, their worldview can't even support it. Well, what about the Christian worldview? How do we explain that? Very simply. Christians believe in a God who is immaterial, universal, and unchanging. That God created a universe that operates under the laws of logic that themselves are immaterial, universal, and unchanging. If it's in perfectly well so with a Christian... So the law came world. from the God. That's right. Yeah. But this is totally antithetical to an atheistic worldview. So an atheist actually has to assume that God does exist in order to justify the laws of logic to then use logic to tell us why God doesn't exist. That's an amazing article, and I think it's a little different than anything I've ever heard. It's fascinating. We have another example as well, don't we? We do. Uh, but we'll I want to take that. a break first. But we'll, we'll be come testing back. worldviews. We'll be taking a look at science. All right. Don't you go away. We're going to talk about testing worldviews and, and how science fits into that. We'll be right back. We are back and we're talking about uh, using evidence to test worldviews and we had just had an incredible example with logic but now we want to talk about science, Jay. Sure. This will be just one example of using science to test these worldviews that we've been discussing. An example brought along here is the idea of the origin of information. We all use information all the time but you don't always think about where did information come from. And these worldviews they actually give us models as to what they think about these things. In particular, an atheistic worldview says that all the information around us basically came from random actions of molecules smashing together over you know, four billion years, created the information we see in living things. Christian worldview says no. In the beginning was the word, John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was logos, meaning word, information, things like that. So these are the two views that we have, the worldviews. And now we're gonna look at some evidence to see which worldview is better supported by the evidence. So we take a look at a newspaper. A newspaper has a fair amount of information in it, and it uses paper and ink to store that information. Then we have books. Books do an even better job of holding information, also using paper and ink. Then we have a CD, a CD made of metal and plastic. It can contain about 100,000 single pages of text in a single CD, so it does an even better job of holding this information. And then computer hard drives, even better job of storing this information in metal and plastic. In each of these cases, though, Although these physical materials do a great job of storing the information, in none of the cases did the physical materials create the information. In each example, you can trace that back to an intelligent source. The newspaper columnist, the author of the book, software engineer or whatever can always do that. So then you look at DNA. DNA is also made out of physical materials. It does an even better job of storing information. There's over three billion letters on each, you know, these strands of DNA inside each cell. Tons of information there. Wow. And so where did that come from? If the physical materials don't create information, and we see even more information on DNA, where did that come from? So we're going to look at DNA very briefly here. Specifically, in this segment, 
the storage capacity, not only the information that's on the DNA, but its ability to store information. And we're going to look at just a pinhead amount of DNA, how much information could be stored in that volume. Well, again, I mentioned a single CD can hold about 100,000 pages of text. And then a little thumb drive, a two gig thumb drive, can hold three entire CDs, so about 300,000 pages of text on a thumb drive. And today we use portable hard drives to back up our computers. A two terabyte hard drive can hold a thousand thumb drives on it. So it's a great job of storing information. Now, let's compare a two terabyte hard drive to just a little bit, a little pinhead amount of DNA. You could actually fit two million two terabyte hard drives in a pinhead amount of DNA. That's amazing. It is absolutely amazing. So we go back to our predictions here. What we've just seen with the evidence fits in very well with the creation account, creation worldview, that God created all this to begin with, but it's totally antithetical, again, to an atheistic worldview of particles smashing together to be able to create something like this. So all we did here was we were testing worldviews. It's not about trying to prove these things, because science doesn't prove things, but we're testing our worldviews, and we've seen that the evidence is really lining up with the Christian worldview, but antithetical to the atheistic worldview. That's, that's amazing. Um, so where does the information come from? Well, if it doesn't come from God, where does it come from? Well, they have to believe that it was truly particles smashing together, eventually creating information, but there's nothing in science or nature that actually has replicated that. That's their faith. <laughs> Take, yeah, yeah, taking us back to all those nasty things they said about faith, they end up having to have a, a huge amount of faith and random chance, don't they? Definitely. Uh, what we've been talking about here is actually called presuppositional apologetics. And I didn't mention that at the beginning. I didn't want to scare the viewers away. <laughs> they might go somewhere else and watch paint dry. It sounds more interesting. Yeah. But all this means is we look at our presuppositions, which presuppositions are things you assume to be true to begin with. We evaluate those beginning assumptions, those biases, those starting points to see how foundational they are, how solid they are, because if you're off in your foundation, you can't use that to, be, uh, to validate anything after that. So if someone's an atheistic worldview is off, they're kind of done because they're going to use that worldview later to interpret all the evidence. So it doesn't pay to just throw evidence at them because the foundation they're using to interpret it is off. So we need to get down to that level. Uh, everybody has presuppositions, which means everyone has a worldview. I always think of them, we have glasses that we wear. We all have lenses that we look through the, the world at. And uh, I, was, I was thinking when you were talking about the, you know, the simple little verse in the scripture that says, the heavens declare the glory of God. Well, they don't declare the glory of God to everybody. They only declare the glory of God to those who assume that God made the heavens. And if we don't, if we don't start by uh, understanding that's not going to be the same thing in their eyes as it is in ours, we can talk forever and we'll never get anywhere. Sure. And this talk basically teaches Christians how to defend their faith without having to have advanced degrees in science and philosophy right. and all that. Right. It's a much simpler way and it's less intimidating and it helps train them to ask good questions of the skeptic rather than getting down into the weeds of all these technical details. Right. We can back up and say, wait a minute, how does your worldview even account for things like logic or the laws of science or where did matter and energy come from? But they'll typically want to get you dragged down in the fact that bacteria become resistant to antibiotics. And <laughs> a lot of Christians are like, I don't know anything about that. Right. Well, what you could say is like, that's an interesting question, but I have got some other questions. If you could answer those first, maybe we could get back to that. I think that's, that's tremendous. And, and when we do that, the evidence seems to always line up on the side of a rational, cognitive God who in the beginning spoke and created everything. It sure, sure seems to me to take less faith for that than random chance. And so we need, we need lifestyles. We need uh, to be a kind of people whose life validates our arguments before we ever make the argument, if that makes sense. Very important, I think. There are too many Christians that are probably very well intended, but they're yes. kind of angry and yeah. they're always trying to argue with people. That's not winsome. That's not going to draw people yeah. to them. But if you can be kind and gracious and accepting, just like God has been gracious with us, yeah. we need to mimic that with the skeptics to draw them in. Jay, that's one of the things I love about you is that so many guys who have kind of an apologetic bent, they, they sort of assume that if I win the argument, we've won. We can win all the arguments in the world, but God called us to win the world. Yes. And uh, I, I appreciate not only the wisdom that you're sharing, but the spirit with which you share. Sure, Thanks for sharing with us today. You're welcome. Folks, you've heard some great truth today that ought to call you to some self-examination. We ought to all look in our hearts 
and make sure that we not only have the truth, but that we have it wrapped in love. You know, the thing that, is, that John said about Jesus was that he was full of two things. He was full of grace and he was full of truth. And if we as God's people can, can have that incredible combination of living a grace-filled life while we speak the truth in love, then I think we can not only win arguments, we can win people. You know, God came to us that way. The, the God of all creation came to us, entered his creation, and walked a life of love as he spoke the truth of how we could be right with God. Let's live that way. Let's you and I determine that we're going to get over being angry and that we're going to live the love of God so that we can speak the truth of God. You know, my friends, the longer we're at this, the more we see that it's God's view that he created you. He created you to live that God life that will help others to see the truth as well. And so it should be your worldview that you'll walk out the love of God every day. God bless you, my friend. I hope you'll join us again soon for Origins. And until then, God bless you. Thank you for watching this edition of Origins. If you'd like a copy of the PowerPoint information presented today, you can download a PDF file from our website at www.originstv.org. Or for a DVD of this series, you can order online or send a $12 donation to cover shipping and handling and write to Origins Program Number 1505, Cornerstone Network, Wall, Pennsylvania, 15148. Origins is made possible by the faithful prayers and financial support of you, our Cornerstone family.